know about you, but I would be pretty annoyed if I had my royal court by my side 24-7. If you were an Egyptian monarch, most of your waking hours as a pharaoh would be constantly surrounded by people. The associates around you would include members of the royal court, as many officials, family members, nobles, servants, and royal bodyguards would be included. From sunrise to sunset, you would never have a moment alone. Considering getting a position in the royal court, aside from on-hired craftsmanship jobs like architects, majority of the nobles that filled the ranks were the pharaoh friends and the relatives that were promoted into these positions of court. So in some way, it was some type of nepotism that benefited you next to the king. Just like in the French monarchy before they ended up being cut off, the Queen Marie Antoinette would wake up with her servants at the foot of her bed ready to help her with her day. And that, it, that does beg the question though, would you be also into that or no? Comment below. However, despite having your fam Jan with you at all times, it still doesn't prevent the most obvious fear and that was family members challenging you for your throne and authority. Like majority of rich civilizations like the Romans, the British, the ancient Egyptians, the ancient Chinese Empire, and so many across the world alike all have the unfortunate circumstances of uprising in your own household. Like as an example with Japan and their empire, there's a theory that some say the emperors in ancient times, such as Emperor Su Jin, Emperor Ojin, and Emperor Kitai, usurped the imperial throne regardless of the blood relations with the past emperors. And in ancient Egypt, the same saying goes with the other rulers like for Ramesses III, one of his wives had apparently orchestrated a rebellion on him so her own son would rule. And of course in England with Queen Elizabeth and her sister Queen Mary, both had conflicts due to their father's many misbehaviors. But even as a royal with so many people tagging along beside you, from the moment you wake up to the moment you wipe your butt on the toilet or even going to bed, it does include what you wore. As a representative of your nation and your people, you had to be dressed to the nines at all times. In ancient Egypt, as an example, they took their wigs very seriously as they even also had a law that outlined those who could and could not wear them. Even according to their laws, it was illegal for slaves to wear wigs and if you were an elite member of the court or part of the royal family, you were most likely also going to have a quality wig compared to other people. Most royal wigs were the most elaborate and they would also include gold and silver and threads and even pharaohs would sometimes wear fake beards alongside their wigs for specialized events. And even with these specialized events, wearing fake beards might even suggest engagements. Like in some cultures, you'd have to ask permission to the family's head or in most cases the lady's father to court her or wed her. And in some, this also includes the royal family aka the British royal family. According to the Royal Marriage Acts in 1772, British royal descendants don't have their liberty to exercise this right of love because they have to seek the monarchy's approval before the proposing. Queen Elizabeth II, when she was alive and well, all the other monarchs after her would also follow suit in the approval of every relations. Even the former Queen Elizabeth II had approved every union involving her children and grandchildren, including the one between Prince Andrew and Fergie, and the one between Prince Charles and Camilla Parker Bowles. She also extended her blessings approval for William's proposal to Middleton and Harry's request for Meghan Markle's hand in marriage. Also, I know it's now King Charles, I forgot. But aside, like all rules in regards to marriage, this also involves the conversation of succession. In 1688, when it came to the British monarchs, James II fled England and the English Parliament flexed his political muscle and offered the throne to James's daughter Mary and her husband William of Orange instead of his son. Since then, Parliament has basically decided who is king or queen, but they use the same strict criteria. The new ruler must be descendants of the Princess Sophia, the Electress of Hanover, and granddaughter of James I, and a Protestant in communion with the Church of England, who swears to preserve the Church of England and the Church of Scotland. And because of the confliction they had during the Roman Catholic Church due to King Henry VIII's excessive desire to have a son, Roman Catholics are expressively forbidden from ever ruling. The actual order of succession goes through Charles III's family and has been worked out down to the 23rd person, Queen Elizabeth's one-year-old great-grandson, Lucas Tyndall, who has to wait a while, I think. Heirs to the throne are not permitted to travel together. Traveling together for a family vacation is the most awaited times of our lives, but British royal families can't celebrate vacations together as according to the rules, no two heirs can travel together to maintain the order of succession. However, when Prince William and his wife Kate Middleton had children, the prohibition was eased when Prince George turns 12, he will also have to start flying separately from his father. The Cambridges also frequently flown from their children in the past, but typically received special permission from the head of state to do so. It is also a rule that royals must always carry a black outfit while traveling, and reason being is in case there's an unexpected death in the family. This way they can also be properly dressed to fit the somber occasion when they arrive back to the UK. This rule was created after the unexpected death of Queen Elizabeth's father, King George VI, as she was rushed home from Kenya and had to wait on a plane in London until someone brought her a change of clothes. According to Bustle, it also had been deemed inappropriate for Elizabeth to emerge in London in a normal dress after the death of the king, as well, although it's not officially a rule, traditionally royals are expected to wear black only during funerals. Generally, it is also thought black is not worn unless it's in mourning, although Princess Diana, Diana, Princess of Wales, did occasionally wear it for evening functions. The National Geographic documentary of Diana, in her own words, is narrated entirely by the late princess, using 
using rare audio recordings made by Diana in 1991. During one scene, Diana recalls a time Charles rebuked her for wearing a black dress during a royal engagement, and he commented she should wear it as black is only for the people who are in mourning, and she responded, yes, but I'm not part of your family yet. Speaking of death, through when it came to the ancient Egyptians, if a family member died, specifically a pharaoh, so did everyone else. In ancient Egypt, they believed that when you passed away, your spiritual body continues into the afterlife, so to a place very similar to the living world, however, an entry to this ethereal paradise was not guaranteed. For he dead must venture on and negotiate a dangerous underworld journey and face a final judgement before they regained access. See, alongside the animals that were also mummified with their owners, even servants would be buried alongside them. It's a terrifying thought though, that the possibility of your boss dying so you have to die with them. That way they have someone to do the house chores around the afterlife still. Do you get extra pay though? I guess there's no point since we're both you know not around anymore. But this was also be more common however for the pharaoh of Egypt he did not want to go down alone. So yes you do have to work for the king but at what cost seems to be a very consistent theme in history. But even with the wives of the pharaohs or wives of regular men would also be buried with their partner and since they too didn't want to linger in the afterlife alone I mean I guess I mean being alone isn't a bad thing right? Even with death came out a note of rumors and cover ups. Apparently, in some rumors that King George V didn't die peacefully, but was actually comatose, but because he couldn't rule, it was processed made by his physician to inject him with fatal doses of substance. Even the physician's confession, he wrote that he only did it so that the announcement could be beyond time for the morning papers instead of the evening ones. And considering the traditions of wiping out monarchs for the view of the public, the Queen's first cousin had developments of disabilities that were shamefully hidden from the public and was assumed legally dead. When in fact, this scandal exploded to the public that the royals just couldn't do that. Well, they could do that to their own members. But the thing is, it wasn't the first time the royals did this, as as we know how progressive the world is now, I'm sure it wouldn't be the last. King George V, the same king who denied the Tsar of Russia his own cousin from amnesty from their own rebellion in Russia, he also tucked away his youngest child from the public because he suffered from epilepsy. And finally, one other odd tradition and more on the lighter side, I guess it is the Waterloo ceremony. Every year, the monarch celebrates the historic British victory of the Battle of Waterloo by having the Duke of Wellington pay rent. It was the first Duke of Wellington who on June 18th, 1815 led British forces to victory against Napoleon and so as a thank you the crown purchased a house in Hampshire for him. Eight dukes later the person holding this position still resides in that same house. On June 18th of every year the Duke of Wellington commemorates the Waterloo victory by paying a rent for the house but it's not money, it's just purely a symbolic transaction because these people don't pay rent, they don't pay taxes either. During which their duke gives the queen a silk embroidered french flag in the guard chamber at Windsor Castle the flag is draped over a bust of the Duke of Wellington. Number 10, bad boys. Starting off pretty light before we get into the nitty gritty because if you know me, you know I love exposing horrible people. Anyways, let's start with Princess Beatrice. She was once in a very aggressively intense relationship with a man named Paolo Luzzo who apparently was a bad boy. But not just a bad boy, he was convicted of many dangerous crimes while they were together. And although Princess Beatrice's own mother tried to diffuse attention saying, We all have our own journey and we all have to learn our own way and many friends include Paolo. Keep in mind she was 17 years old when she got involved with the 24 year old and as well this 24 year old Paolo was also involved in the death of a teenager he was apparently on probation the whole time. In 2002 Paolo was charged with manslaughter death of a fellow student over a drunk fight. Either way, Paolo admitted that after they split up that he wasn't actually in love with Beatrice the whole time. He cheated on her so many times while they were dating. To be fair, Paolo did end up getting arrested in Australia in 2009 after he dined and dashed and crashed a rental Audi and he was found with two grams of coke and not the cola, the other one. As for Beatrice, she got married to a man from a noble family and got a kid now, so good for her. It makes sense when you're a royal monarch that when you travel, you travel well. After all, there's a lot of rules when it comes to being a person of ultimate power. Like how they can't travel in twos in the same family or they gotta have a funeral prep outfit just in case someone dies while they travel. As for other things, they even have to carry their own personal blood bag. According to the Telegraph, the former queen and her son, now King Charles, always brought a personal blood bag just in case he traveled in countries that lacked blood supply. And no, it wasn't for eating or eternal youth, I know some conspiracy theorists are enjoying this, but this was just in case of an emergency blood transfusion was essential. All you needed was a doctor on hand, which is why the Royal Navy doctor accompanies every royal on their trip just in case. Considering the royal family had a lot of members that done a lot of outrageous things, including involving themselves in German dictatorship dictatorship regimes in the Second World War, King George asked Britain's security services to put surveillance on his own brother Edward and his wife Wallace Simpson under the cognitation of their sympathy for the regime. Even King Edward VIII, the former queen's uncle, was very close to his German cousins and their culture, which seems of course fine in that specific order, but a specific dictator did take over power in the 1920s and 1930s. Even Prince Philip had four sisters, all whom married German atro uh, aristocracy, and three out of four were sympathizers for the dictator regime. Despite being British rule, the bloodline is roughly made up of half of German uh, ancestors. 
Despite being the British royal, the bloodline is also roughly made up of uh, half German ancestors. Number seven, Prince Philip is gross. Considering he was the longest serving consort in the British monarchy, he was super racist and problematic. Prince Philip was known to have an aggressive, um, unprompted offensive remarks that's been noted for a really long time. And although at the age of 95 in 2017, the 40 years prior of his racist and degrading statements were always brushed off as meh, that's just Philip. And if you don't believe me, then again, why wouldn't you believe me? He is a British monarch whose family didn't disregard apartheid. He would say crazy things on a trip like in China. In 1986, he told British students if they stayed there longer, their eyes would become slit-eyed. <sighs> With his whole chest, this man had the audacity to say so many insane things, like I don't think a prostitute is more moral than a wife, but they're doing the same thing. Told a 13-year-old he should lose weight if he wants to be an astronaut, and told a 14-year-old he looks like he's on and he even asked a sea cadet if she worked at a I mean, yes, it seems like a very clearly early 2000 Comedy Central type of skit or something that one family member you have to warn other people to meet before a meeting would say. But for a British royal, it wasn't really much of a dark secret of him being the way that he was. But man, people need to stop acting like these people are great people. When they're just regular human beings, just in positions of power, it's just because they got a lot of money. And number six, taxes. Speaking of money, you know when they say eat the rich, I think aside the rhetoric of it being a human eating another human, I think it's more or less on the fact that there is so much damn money going to rich people that they continuously find justifications to avoid taxes. Meanwhile, the average hardworking person struggles daily to make ends meet under a minimum wage while also dealing with the cost of living, including food, rent, commuting, and overall expenses increases. Not to mention, if you're a student trying to go to school, I can't imagine the tuition. As of 2023 in the UK, the national living wage is roughly 10 to 11 pounds per hour, but the, but the price of rent average to the UK according to the Home Let Rental Index is about 1,283 pounds. So why am I mentioning this? Well, that's because the royal family earns as of notive of May 2023 an annual taxpayer-funded payment known as the Sovereign Grant of 86.3 billion pounds. Sorry, that's too much. <laughs> of eight of 86.3 million pounds. Oh my gosh, can you imagine if it was billion? According to Norman Baker, a politician and author of What the Royal Family Doesn't Want You to Know, mentions the costs are twice as any other monarch in Europe. And in quote, that is a grotesque underestimate because there are a number of benefits to the royal family which aren't available to other monarchs in Europe. And even with King Charles now in position, apparently the goal in 2025, the king's public funding will increase to a projected 38.5 million pounds, and by 2026, 126 million. So where does this money all go? Apparently to public safety, the police, and of course the maintenance of the royal head, but that's a lot of money. And as of Norman said, twice as any other monarch in Europe. And while the average British citizen are having difficulty putting food on the table, at least the King Charles can have time of his life with concert Queen Camilla mocking Canadian indigenous Inuit people performing throat singing. Number five, sorry cousin, I didn't mean to say this, well, I meant to say this, this family is absolutely ridiculous when it comes to their treatment of others, especially each other. I mean, I'm surprised they lasted this long, I mean, do they even love each other? Or are, even they, or, or are they even allowed to? Either way, they definitely showed love when they denied family members asylum. And by that, I mean King George V denied his cousin Tsar Nicholas II and his family. And if you know the story of Anastasia, you know the massacre that occurred. Tsar Nicholas II requested asylum in Britain for himself and his family, but he was denied King George worried the rise of political tension in his own country. Which to be honest, in a political standpoint, it makes sense as it was during a time where there was a lot of tension after the First World War, and the financial means was floundering due to taxes as well as the loss of life. And considering the two was very close, I can't imagine the heartbreak for the Tsar Nicholas to have his own favorite cousin say no. And in the end, we do know how the history played out for the Romanov family. Number four, hidden families. Speaking of families that the British family seems to not do much about, if you ever watched The Crown and you know that in season four, again, spoilers, or not spoilers, you can literally Google this. Anyways, it's true that the Queen's first cousins had development disabilities and were shamefully hidden from the public and was assumed legally dead, when in fact the scandal exploded in the public that the royals could do that to their own family members. But the thing is, this wasn't the first time the royals did this, and I know how progressive the world is now, I'm pretty sure it wouldn't be the last. King George V, the same king who denied the Tsar of Russia, his own cousin, he actually stowed away his own youngest child from the public view because he suffered from epilepsy. According to the royal biographer Christopher Wilson, he noted that when it comes to family trees, it feels like if they feel like someone wasn't in the top notch level they can present to the public in a way that indicates the crown is unshakable or unhealthy, they can just write them out of the history books and no one would know. Like Prince John, the moment he died, no one heard anything about him ever since. Number three, Prince Andrew is disgusting. It's no surprise when it comes to powerful people, they do the most outlandish crap because they got money to do so. And when it comes to Prince Andrew, who by the way is the father of Princess Beatrice, the one who I mentioned earlier dating a convict, Prince Andrew had a lot of scandals, especially his involvement with the convicted offender Jeffrey Epstein. Considering there was a lot of illegal involvement in trafficking, including the violent, non-consensual involvement with a 17-year-old girl, it's because he was a prince and a powerful man and was able to do so, which is why he was able to commit to these crimes undercover. But once the news got wind, it turned into a whole hurricane. The royal general's response to his involvement in Epstein's scandal should go down as a lesson in what not to do in a PR crisis situation. Following the bumbling interview, Prince Andrew announced that he would step down the public duties for the foreseeable future, reportedly because 
because his mother, the queen, told him to do so. The prince had also been stripped of his military titles and is no longer allowed to use the phrase His Royal Highness in official capacity as the change took place the day after the case was allowed to go forward in January. Number 2 Princess Diana Can't talk about the royal family without talking about the lovely Princess Diana. And if you grew up with an immigrant household, I bet your mom loved Princess Diana. Or in general, because a lot of women and moms in general loved Princess Diana as she was known as the people's princess. She had no shame showing her love to the people unlike the royal family who was always forced to be reserved away from the public view. But Diana didn't give a dang and loved her as hard as much as she could, but sadly she did suffer a great deal of depression and anxiety along the way. And considering she has an incompetent husband who had an obsession being a, can uh, being a tampon for Camilla, yes you can look that up, it was a very weird phone call he had with her. I can't believe Diana dealt with that, and for what? Well, for her kids. But in association with her depression and suffering from eating disorders, she actually apparently threw herself down some stairs while she was pregnant. Now, she was struggling to get Charles to pay attention and give her the affirmation she needed, and considering she was struggling, not just as a married royal who was also aggressively in the public eye, she was struggling to be even noticed as a human being in the palace. So she admitted she threw herself down the stairs. Charles didn't budge though, as he didn't care as he went around horseback riding. And before some people think she was being dramatic, as someone who's certified in suicide prevention, I can tell you the signs were there. In fact, I have close friends who were also pregnant fall to this level of graphic depression to the point we had to ensure emergency safety to them, and watch them as in order to make sure that they survived. So again, if you need someone to talk to or need help, just no, there's always someone out there. Domestic violence is a real thing, and no one should go through that alone. Number one, apartheid. It's no secret that the British were involved during a time of apartheid. I mean, my god, it's the British. Colonization? Nah, so many. English, in general, is the most dominating language in the world, so it makes abundantly clear who's been going around conquering everybody. The apartheid regime brought soon a lot of tension to the royal relations. After 1947, members of the royal family avoided South Africa despite the queen being sovereign until 1961. And although the former Queen Elizabeth tried to forge a close relationship with the late South African leader Nelson Mandela, when she died, South African's Marxist opposition party, the Economic Freedom Fighters, said, We do not mourn the death of Elizabeth. They quote, Our interaction with Britain has been one of pain, death, and disposition, and of dehumanization of the African people. It said, Listing atrocities committed by the British forces in the late 19th and early 20th century, and the pain that lasted because of apartheid still lingers. But the revolution and constant upheaval from that struggle is why South Africa still remains strong despite its traumatizing history. After all, there are so many right now that have been infected by the British royal family's involvement in countries that they shouldn't uh, touch at all. Like India, Palestine, the Caribbean, Southeast Asia, Asia in general, North America, there's a lot of countries. Number 10 is Eric the 14th. That's a lot of Eric's to get to 14, and it's a lot of paranoia in his case. The Swedish king survived three years of ruling before he lost his mind, first taking the throne in 1560, and then having his life taken in 1577. In 1563, when the crazy struck, Eric became violent and paranoid, rubbing his nobility and court members the wrong way until he pulled a daring move, imprisoning the Sturr's noble family for allegedly plotting against him. However, he quickly came to the conclusion that the incarceration wasn't enough and decided to have them killed instead. Eric himself participates in their grisly deaths, and after their death sentences, Eric wandered outside to the woods and disappeared for three days. This led to open conflict between Sweden's nobility and Eric, who was eventually dethroned and imprisoned by his despised half-brother John in 1569. The former king languished in prison for the next seven years before being put out of his misery in 1577. Turns out Eric's paranoia may have been onto something. After the 20 20th century exhumation, forensic scientists determine Eric died from his pea soup being poisoned. Number 9 is The Glutton, a nickname for King Afonso, also called The Grinning Moron. A nickname he earned from doing things like wearing six hats at once, tiered Mad Hatter style, or because he visited all the nunneries around to offer himself up as a willing bedmate. This is also the king who famously saw his two older siblings die, and instead of crying, he cheered and went, hooray, now I will be the king of Portugal. All of this perceived madness allegedly comes from how Alfonso was ill as a child, and it left him partially paralyzed and mentally unstable. Unfortunately, he found pleasure in violence, and this made for a bad combination, especially when a local boy named Antonio, who liked to whip stones at people, offered the king knives and said he should join. Alfonso's mother tried to stop her son, who now went out at night and tormented the poor villagers, and forbade Antonio to enter the palace. Deprived from Antonio's company, Alfonso became completely unmanageable and refused to eat food like a brat. So they let Antonio back in. He soon established himself in a room next to Afonso and began to lead the king on nightly excursions, jumping respectable citizens and raiding taverns. This goes on for years until his mother dies and Antonio is sent away. Then Afonso focuses his attention onto food. At the age of 23, Afonso was incredibly large thanks to gluttony. He used to take his meals in bed and usually ate and drank so much he was sick afterwards. Ministers ruled on behalf of the screw loose Afonso for years, but they still tried to make Afonso behave like a king. Told what to do, he did it 
told what to say, he said it. Still, his way of life infuriated the Portuguese clergy, so they find him a wife, hoping it'd calm him down. Instead, they annul, and she marries his younger, hotter brother, and the two begin planning a coup. In his final days, like many of the other monarchs on this list, he was confined. It was said he wore a groove in the floor from pacing, since he couldn't do anything else. Number eight is Snotty King. Unlike Afonso, who victimized the nearby villages, France's King Charles IX actually went after others in his court, including his sisters and even animals. Charles had a disfiguring birthmark between his nose and upper lip, giving him the nickname the Snotty King. And he was given to fits of rage and sadism, though he was a mama's boy to his regent, Catherine de Medici, who literally ran this country even once the king grew up. In 1561, at the age of 10, Charles took the throne after all eligible heirs had died, through no fault of his own. As he grew up, Charles became tall and physically strong, but his physical and mental problems increased with age, and as one suffered, so did the other. Charles was unbalanced to the point of insanity, and his anger was solved through violence or death that only Margot, his youngest sister, knew how to calm. If she wasn't around, someone would hand him a bow and arrow and say, hey, go hunt some deer nearby. However, things like hunting and field sports didn't satisfy his bloodlust, and that's exactly what it was, bloodlust. To quote Charles himself, he preferred to use the knife because he liked the blood and wanted to see it spurting out of animals. Shudder. So he fed this lust by dismembering domestic animals. He also liked lashing people until they bled, or going down to the blacksmith to beat out weapons for his armory until he was prostate with exhaustion. Then he'd go use them on more animals, or people. Number seven is Fyodor the Bellringer, who was the son of Ivan the Terrible and wasn't thrilled about ruling and left most of it up to his brother-in-law Boris Godunov. This would-be ruler is remembered for having next to no neck and spindle legs that made him shuffle in a stooped manner. That and his glazed vacant gaze paired with a permanent gillless smile that was variously ascribed to religious ecstasy or simple-mindedness, depending on the observer's point of view. Suffice it to say, even Ivan the Terrible knew his son was missing a few screws. So anticipating his own death, Ivan had tried to smooth the path for his humbly gifted son by creating a five-member advisory council to help him rule, which is how Boris ends up in charge. Because Fyodor didn't just not know how to rule, but he wasn't interested in doing so. In the 16th century Russia, feeble-mindedness was considered an especially inspired and childish form of wisdom, a foolishness in Christ. Apparently in the olden days, Russians characteristically looked at these persons with respect, if not reverence. This is why unlike so many kingdoms on this list, Fyodor wasn't just tossed in a room and left to rot. Homeboy actually dies peacefully in his bed. Fyodor spent most of his time praying, visiting monasteries and churches throughout the realm, and of course, what he was named for, ringing the bells that called the faithful to mass. Number six is Maria of Portugal. She starts as Maria the Pious, the first undisputed queen regent of Portugal and the first monarch of Brazil, who spent the first 10 years of her reign as an eloquent and respected leader. Then 1786 rolls around and she needs to be carried back into her castle due to a random state of delirium that hits her. Unfortunately, that wouldn't be the last. In 1786, Maria loses her husband slash uncle, her eldest son and heir, her only daughter, and then her confessor consecutively. Maria had already been in a fragile state, but their losses caused her to nosedive into religious delirium. Convinced she was going to hell for the sins of her father, claiming to see his black and charred corpse dragging itself along hallways of her home, or in her mind's eye, being tormented by demons. Visitors to her apartments would complain that they were tired of her constant screaming and wailing, which was only amplified by the bloodletting that was meant to cure it. According to some reports, she also became rather fond of wearing really tiny clothing. Number five is Charles the Mad. There's many crazy rulers named Charles. Maybe it should have been written off as a royal name at this point. But this Charles may have been mad because of schizophrenia, which nobody in his time would have understood or treated accurately. Honestly, much of the same can be said for multiple rulers on the list as their afflictions were caused by mental illnesses and not always by the fact their parents were also their aunt and uncle. Charles didn't really become crazy at any given point, rather grew into it. He believed he was made of glass, liable to shatter at any moment. To prevent himself from shattering, the king had iron rods sewn into his clothing, the world's first Iron Man. So suck it, Tony Stark. In 1392, Charles attempted to kill his own friend and then got confused as to what was happening while he did it. Coming to, he thought someone else had jumped his friend, so he took an army after the supposed perpetrator. Then he falls back into the same weird state he was in when he tried to kill his friend in the first place and cuts down four of his own men. The others have to drag their king from the horse to get him to stop, at which point he enters a catatonic state and has to be wheeled back to the castle in a cart. They concluded that he was probably just under a lot of stress, as it was the first time Charles had really shown signs of not being totally right in the head. In the following years, Charles would go through episodes of forgetting people's names, including his own, and the fact he was king, when he wasn't running through his castle pretending to be a wolf and howling at people. He was later removed from power for acting insane, but not dethroned, since Charles the Mad lived for some 30 years after his first fit of the crazies, while his brother started a civil war for his throne. Number 
number four is the Zengdi Emperor. This Ming Dynasty ruler is one of their most notorious. Unfortunately, not for good reasons to end up on this list. Speaking of, if you're enjoying, maybe take a second to subscribe to The Hive to stay up to date because we have plenty more lists like this. The Zengdi Emperor was renowned for both his foolishness and his cruelty, despite making some major campaign and political decisions that benefited his country. When he wasn't, well, the emperor played pretend. He built a whole fake city block on imperial grounds where he would pretend to be a shopkeeper to the puzzlement of his subjects who were forced to go along with it. Occasionally, he pretended he was an army general despite having no experience or expertise and went on raiding parties where he'd almost get captured. And he'd make the entirety of the army dress in all silk for some reason while doing this. Weirder still, this emperor invented an alter ego he named Zhu Shu, whom he would order on these said pointless raiding parties to the exasperation of his government who had to pretend they weren't just talking to their own emperor in a wig. Ming era novels such as the Zengdi Emperor roams through Jiangnam, cast the emperor as a foolish and gullible man, at one point enjoying a bowl of rice gruel he believes to be made from cooked pearls. Number three is Maria Eleonora. Desperate to give her husband an heir, Maria of Sweden had a slew of pregnancy issues that drowned her in postpartum depression and anxiety, on top of the court pressure to even produce a girl at this point, just something as an heir. This was a lot for her mentally, so when she finally did succeed in producing a child, a girl named Christina, she completely lost it. The postpartum was too much for this queen who screamed that she hated the dark eyes and the hair of this girl and woed over not having a son and that God was punishing her. Meanwhile, the girl's father was wearing a big hat, cigar in hand, and grinning ear from ear. Christina had to be kept from her unstable mother who couldn't be trusted alone with the girl after some sketchy incidents occurred. That changed when her husband, King Gustavus Adolphus, who was happy to have a daughter, was battle less than two years later. Maria Eleonora responded with hysterical grieving. She shrieked in despair. She was inconsolable, lamenting her cruel fate to be robbed of the light of her life while they were still both so young. That grief, however, included keeping her husband's body above ground for 18 months so she could periodically touch it, cuddle it, and kiss it, you name it. All the while, she made Christina sleep under a golden casket that contained her father's heart. But their relationship improved after that, and miraculously, Christina grew up to be a functioning woman and queen. Number two is Mustafa of Turkey. This is one where crazy can't be blamed on the dude himself or the parents being siblings, but rather the classic sultan tradition of locking the royal family away in cages to keep them from usurping the throne. Mustafa I was locked in said gilded cage for 10 years and was actually spared the usual fate of death by his elder brother Ahmed. After his brother died airless, Mustafa's released from his golden cage, but then he's sent back just a few months later when his brother's son took the throne instead. Apparently Mustafa was very neurotic from living in fear of sudden death while locked in a box for 14 years. When his nephew was in a coop just after four Four years later in 1622, Mustafa was once again dragged from the safety of his cage to have the crown flopped on his head. He was frequently found running through the palace, knocking on doors and screaming for his dead nephew to come back and rule Turkey again. Many doctors treated Mustafa, but his condition only worsened. He was often seen talking to imaginary people and fed coins to fish and birds. What completely convinced the viziers that something was off was when, during a court meeting, Mustafa yanked on their beards and tossed off their turbans as part of a fit. He was dethroned after three months of rule because he refused to bet a woman and concerns for an heir flourished. That, and he was nuts. Number one is George III, who made it 28 years before he was first hit with his mental illness in 1788, which we now believe to be a case of acute porphyria, anxiety, hallucinations, severe pain, nausea, vomiting, palpitations, high blood pressure, numbness, muscle weakness, brown or red urine, and blindness are some of these diseases' many symptoms, and they were once all found in this wacky king. I said it first hit in 1788, and it hit hard. The king was gibbering for hours on end and foaming at the mouth. Symptoms deemed serious enough for a bill to be drawn up in Parliament for his son, George I, to become regent. Before the bill could pass, George, the initial one, recovered from his senses and all was well with the king for the next 11 years. He had a small relapse in 1801 and 1804. Then in 1810, his mental illness came down hard and it never left again. This intelligent, polite family man had turned into a raving lunatic. A visitor to Windsor was astonished to watch the king bury a stake near the castle, believing it would grow into a beef tree. Another saw the king King trying to shake hands with an oak tree, believing it to be the king of Prussia. His doctor, Francis Willis, believed the root cause of the mental illness was overexcitement and intended to cure the king by strictly controlling his behavior. If the king acted up, Willis ordered the servants gag him and place him in straitjacket and leave him to thrash around, making incomprehensible noises until he calmed himself down. When the king behaved himself, he was rewarded by being allowed to see members of his family. When he misbehaved, it was back into the straitjacket. Even mealtimes became a carrot and stick exercise. When George was bad, he ate mushed up 
food from a wooden spoon. When he was good, he got to use cutlery. The final blow came in 1810. Already almost blind due to cataracts, the king suffered a final catastrophic mental breakdown that left him permanently gone. He would babble for hours, lost the ability to walk, and eventually succumb to dementia. Towards the end of his life, he was incapable of understanding anything, such as the death of his beloved wife, and lived as a long-haired, bushy-bearded recluse in Windsor Castle until his death from pneumonia in 1820. Kicking off our list at number 10, Princess Diana. We'll start with a tragedy right off the gate. Here we go. Prince Charles, the oldest son of the queen, he straight up admitted to having an affair with Camilla right before his divorce from his first wife, Princess Diana. So in turn, Princess Diana addressed that relationship and what exactly happened. During that famous 1995 interview with BBC, she couldn't have said it better if I'm being honest myself. Diana said, very confidently, well, there were three of us in this marriage, so it was a bit crowded. That's a Princess Diana roast, folks. Oh no! Yeah, Princess Diana, she's full of roasts, apparently. Diana also said she was in love with riding instructor Major James Hewitt during her marriage to Charles, so everybody was a little busy, it seemed, and rightfully so. Diana's like, yeah, I'm not hanging out with this guy. Diana and Charles divorced in 1996, only a year before her tragic accident took her life. Later in 2005, he married Camilla. Yeah, has anybody seen Spencer? Kristen Stewart looks great in that movie, and I wanna know if it's worth the watch. Comment down below. Number nine, The Great Fire. One of the most wild Nostradamus predictions of all time. It reads, the blood of the just will commit a fault at London, burnt through lightning of 23's the sixth. The ancient lady will fall from her high place. Several of the same sect will be killed. Now, there are of course many people who believe that this entry here was actually one that predicted the Great Fire of London that occurred in 1666. The line 23 is the sixth and times 20 by three, and then you add six, you get 66. Right, quick math. But most importantly, it may also mention London and the royal family. And in real life, this fire did affect them as well. Also, it is said by many that the reference to the lady here is another term for the kingdom, the lady. This means that Nostradamus was predicting, maybe, that the kingdom was going to fall as a result of the great fire. So, yeah, he kinda nailed it, I don't know. Number eight, King James. Not to be confused with LeBron James, although he's, he's a pretty good king as well. He's, he's all right, that fellow. This is a different king. In an official 16th century medical book, the actual medical advice at one point was to not bathe. Don't do it or else you're a sinner, I guess. Use not baths or stews, nor sweat too much, for all openeth the pores of a man's body and maketh the venomous air to enter and for to infect the blood. First of all, what? What did you just say? Why is every shred of medical knowledge from the past always written in riddles, like it's a Harry Potter spell, you know what I mean? God forbid you have bronchitis in the 16th century. A doctor is like, ah, yes, just a, a flower petal. We'll fix that. The doctor was one of these comes in. No way. Not listening to that guy. They thought that taking a bath would make you sick. So King James IV, apparently, he never took a bath. And his hygiene was so bad that he would sometimes pass on lice to others just by walking by them. He would walk by and they'd be like, Ugh. Guy's got Steven Tyler's hair. What is that? Like, can we cut it if it's infected with gross? Can we just, maybe a bald king? How does a bald king sound? Number seven, King Rudolph II. The Holy Roman Emperor from 1552, he was known as a collector of sorts, these, these royals. They like to collect things, they like to spend their money on weird things. Some princes collect stamps, other collect zoo animals. See, his castle was home to lions, tigers, and orangutans, so good luck getting a full eight hours of sleep, my friends. He also collected human artifacts, this royal, so that's a bit odd to collect when you're a royal. Imagine having company over, you're like, yeah, watch the lion crap, and also don't mind the jars of eyes. Do you want a drink? Let me get you a drink. King Rudolph II, okay, he's quite important in history, obviously. He supported the scientific revolution a lot, and he also poured tons of money into astrology, so he was into cool stuff. Number six, Prince Harry costume party. YouTube doesn't like when I say some words, specifically a word that rhymes with Yahtzee. Mm -hmm. But with this being one of the biggest scandals, I have to bring it up, I have to mention it. The Duke was also referred to as a bad boy, but just how deep did these incidents cut? Was he like topless on a beach and he's bad, or was he dressed up as something horrible at a Halloween party? It was the latter. Before he settled down with Meghan in 2018, Harry had to issue a public apology in 2005 because, huh, whoops, somebody got photos from that party. Did the royal dress up as the Beast from Beauty and the Beast? No. Did he dress up like a witch? No, it would have been fun, but no. 
Photos leaked of him wearing a World War II German soldier outfit. Can't say much here, but it was even equipped with a specific armband. Yeah, we can't show you either, but you get what I'm saying. This was a not great time. It was poor taste. He could have dressed up in any way. He's a royal and he does this instead. I don't know, it's very off-putting. Harry said afterwards, quote, I am very sorry if I caused any offense or embarrassment to anyone, end quote. Wow, he, he really meant that one. Really came from the heart, that, that, that apology. It was a poor choice of costume and I apologize, he says. Okay, number five, King Henry II. This is a quote that people believe was Nostradamus predicting the death of King Henry II, who actually was a personal acquaintance of the prophet himself. That'd be scary. Hey, uh, how do I tell you this? Well, at one point, Nostradamus was seen addressing King Henry II as the most invincible Henry King of France. Unfortunately, Henry proved to be quite vincible when he met his gruesome death at the age of 40. In the summer of 1559, a terrible jousting accident went awry and left the king passing away shortly after from sepsis. This is a terrible story, but I told you it because many think that Nostradamus predicted this. The jousting incident saw the king having splinters driven into his eye and his skull by one of his young soldiers. And the Nostradamus quote reads, the young lion will overcome the older one. Yeah, he's jousting and then the eye, and then it happened. That sucks. Number four, Prince Charles the Vampire. Now, some of these theories, yeah, they're a bit out there. I didn't make them up. I wish I did, but I didn't. Some believers out there actually think Prince Charles is a vampire, a blood sucking, flying, turning into a bat looking vampire. I don't know. Why? Because Prince Charles is related to Vlad the Impaler. You know, that 15th century ruler who inspired the story of Dracula in Transylvania, who we're all pretty sure was a vampire. Now, it's a fun theory that went about, but Prince Charles having a piece of Romania is definitely helping out this case. I, we kind of believe this. The prince has been conserving forests and he even got property over there. So maybe he's a vampire, maybe not. Maybe he just likes property and castles. And Vlad the Impaler. I heard he's a great lad. A great Vlad. Number three, shapeshifters. Awesome. I'm not actually Taylor. I'm someone else pretending to be. That's cool. That's why I'm so energetic today. This next theory I wish I could claim for my own again, but it was actually former BBC presenter David Ick. He takes, the, he takes the cake himself. Here we go. He has since revealed himself as a conspiracy theorist, and one that surrounds the royal family had me stunned. Ick and quite a few others claim that the royal family is part of the Illuminati. Yeah, and then all of them earn their power because their human ancestor mated with reptilian aliens. They were clapping alien reptilians. That's how they became royals. That's the trick. You gotta clap some reptilian alien. David says the theory actually explains why royal families are obsessed with keeping their bloodlines clean with other royals. And you know, incest. <clears throat> but the biggest what the f part of all this has to be when David told the public that he knows people who have seen royal family members change into reptiles and then back into human form again. Number two, leaked letters. We'll end with some recent leaked letters. We love those, we love some gossip. We mentioned Princess Diana, well, we've got more stuff, we've got more tea. In May 2018, the royal wedding, it was thought at the time that Meghan's father was absent because of a heart attack that he suffered days before. But a year or so later, it's revealed that Thomas Markle and the new Duchess weren't as close. There was some, uh, there was some drama, there was some beef going on in the family. Thomas spoke out against his own daughter. There was a scandal where Meghan spoke to Oprah, the tell-all that we all watched, and Meghan actually said to her father that if you tell me the truth about what happened, about working with paparazzi, then we can help and get through it. But he wasn't able to do that, and that for me has really resonated. Yeah, if my dad was working with paparazzi, showing them private letters as well, just for clout, I'd be upset too, as if my dad can't even open his iPad without me, let alone leak my letters. Number one, personal sheet changer. I can't tell if this is the worst thing ever or the best, but it's, it's kept me laughing for months now. Royals have been sweating constantly about other people trying to, you know, take them out, right? It's a scary job, everyone wants to attack you. I mentioned Boyd Jones on here a few times, the guy that stalked the queen. It's terrifying, people are terrifying. Boyd Jones would go through the queen's drawers and you know, big ooh. So historically, the royal family would try their best to anticipate any and all attacks. Be as safe as you can be, right? Of course. Like the kissing sheets, for example. Oh, have you heard about these kissing sheets, this royal position? A great deal of monarchs hired taste testers to make sure nobody poisoned them, that's normal. But they also had a guy who would get tucked in the king's sheets. 
I would much rather have the latter. Know what I mean? King Henry VIII hired somebody to make sure the bed wasn't poisoned. So you were required to make the king's bed every morning, but you also had to rub all the sheets down everywhere before bedtime. You'd have to kiss the bed sheets to make sure they weren't poisoned. Yeah, sleep tight. I'll sleep here, boss. Here we go. Don't, don't mind the old medieval dad breath all over your pillows. You're safe for the night. That's so gross. I can't even sleep in a hotel sometimes, let alone some dude. Mwah, 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 mwah. Mwah, mwah. I'm like, what are you doing? Get this guy out of here. Why is he kissing my bed? Clothes as well. That was also touched. Maybe not kissed, but it was for sure touched. Guys wearing my clothes in my bed, kissing my sheets. No way. I think I'd rather get poisoned. Take my jeans off, get out of there. Number 10, King Edward VIII. Directly after his father died in 1936, King Edward VIII took the throne, right? That's pretty normal. But the tides quickly turned when, less than a year later, he renounced his position. Now, this was of course a huge scandal right off the bat. This is not something that's taken lightly in the royal family. Turns out the woman responsible for stealing his heart was that of Wallace Simpson, American socialite who had already been divorced once before and was at this point working through her second divorce. So you can only imagine how everybody reacted at that point, right? Oh, how dare she? His proposal to Simpson, of course, caused social and political backlash. The Church of England wasn't so chill with Edward marrying someone who had already been divorced. Yeah, they're not really okay with that. So Edward was forced to abdicate. Yeah, he had to, right, for love. Edward and Simpson then tied the knot in 1937, and they stayed together until Edward's death much later in 1972. Sliding into royal DMs right off the hop. Okay, we're in for a treat. Number nine, dark predictions. Of course, in recent years, the royal family has seen a change that many didn't really expect. When Harry and Meghan chose to renounce their royalty status, speculation began that this could be the beginning of the end for the monarchy. People only fueled their fire with questions and also, somebody may have called it. Yeah, Nostradamus, he may have predicted this entire event. One of his predictions literally reads, at the end of the war, the great powers change. Near the coast are born three beautiful children. They will ruin the town when they come of age, they will change the kingdom, and they will not see it grow anymore. Now, Harry is only one of two children, so I'm not sure if the, you know, quote was talking about him and his siblings, or if it has more to do so with some other royal family members, but either way, there's some people who take Nostradamus' words very, very seriously out there, so I had to include it. Maybe there's something there, I don't know. Maybe there's something we haven't quite breaking down yet. That's why we need National Treasure 3. You know, maybe this is the plot. Number eight, King Henry II. While we're on the topic of him, could Nostradamus have actually predicted the death of King Henry II? Because if he did, that's pretty uh, that's pretty curious, I'd say. Never used the word curious in my life, but I'm like, you know what, that's curious. King Henry II was actually a personal acquaintance of the prophet himself. That'd be kind of cool, being friends with Nostradamus. I'd be like, hey, how does Game of Thrones end? Please. While at one point in history, Nostradamus was seen addressing King Henry II as the most invincible King Henry of France, unfortunately, Henry proved to be quite invincible when he met his gruesome death, might I add, at age 40. Yeah, in the summer of 1559, not a great time. A terrible jousting accident went wrong and left the king passing away shortly after from sepsis. This is a terrible story, but I have to explain because, you know, it's history. And well, that's what we're here for. The jousting accident saw the king having splinters driven into his eye and then his skull as well by one of his young soldiers. And the Nostradamus quote reads, the young lion will overcome the older one. It says he will pierce his eyes through a golden cage. Okay, already we're a little bit spooky. And that two wounds will ensure a cruel death. So I'm not saying he predicted it. I'm just saying, eh. Kind of nailed it. Number seven, a fateful turn of events. Queen Victoria, her reign began back in 1837 and it lasted until the queen's death in 1901. Now at just age 18, Alexandrina Victoria had to rise up to the throne. Had to, right? All these cases, it's like, yeah, they have to do this. She was born, of course, on May 24th, 1819. And Queen Victoria was actually fifth in line when she was born, nowhere near the throne. So right off the bat, it was actually highly unlikely that she would ever see the crown. But one by one, all of her family members began passing away fast. In four years, three of Victoria's cousins passed away, and then her father and her grandfather both died one week apart from one another. So on one hand, obviously it's sad, it's tragic, everyone's dealing with loss so fast. But on the other hand, by the time 1830 rolled around, Victoria was only 11 years old, and already she was next up to bat for the throne at 11. Imagine, that's like some ancient Egypt 
Number six, the Great Irish Famine. The Great Irish Famine took out many, many people. Back in 1845, potato crop that a lot of the Irish population relied on were suddenly no longer available. See, a group of microorganisms wiped them out and in result, around one million folks died or had to leave. Now, it was draconian law and British ruling at this point that made the exported food hard to reach people. That's where things stopped. This famine led to Irish independence, of course, and anti-union movements. And the show Victoria pulled back zero punches in 2017, where an episode showed the true happenings behind the Great Irish Famine and the role that Queen Victoria played in coming to the aid of her then subjects. It was the death of at least one million people. This was a very dark seven years in Irish history. Historian Christine Keenley spoke out and says, quote, there is no evidence that she had any real compassion for the Irish people in any way. Yikes. That's a historian saying that. That's, that's, that's how you know. Number five, Meghan Markle, solo strut. Okay, back in May 2018, we all set our alarms, we woke up early, and we all watched the royal wedding, right? We sipped our tea in our pajamas and we pretended like we were there, right? Just watching along with the other billions of people online. Prince Harry and Meghan Markle, his new duchess. At the historic wedding, Thomas Markle was just a no-show. Yeah, Meghan has walked down that aisle by herself in front of a billion people watching at home or streaming it. And it was thought at the time that this was because of Thomas's health. See, right before the wedding, Thomas suffered a heart attack, right? Just days before. So of course nobody was upset. It was almost expected for him not to show up. But cut to a year later, we began talking again. Thomas and the Duchess are now not close, it seems. Thomas even spoke out against his own daughter at one point. There was a huge scandal where Meghan even spoke to Oprah, like Oprah and that big tell-all. And Meghan actually said to her father, if you tell me the truth about working with paparazzi, we can help. And he wasn't able to do that. And for me, has really resonated, especially now as a mother, end quote. So yeah, they're not talking, I guess, anymore, which more than fair. If my dad was working with the paparazzi, showing them private letters, I'd be a little pissed too. There's no way though, the guy can't even unlock his email, let alone sending one, no way. Number four, Prince Charles and Princess Diana's divorce. Prince Charles, the oldest son of the queen, straight up admitted to having an affair with Camilla Parker before his divorce from his first wife, of course, Princess Diana. Imagine having a, like, this is crazy, a princess? You cheated on a princess? That's insane. So in turn, Princess Diana addressed the relationship and what's happening during, you know, that famous 1995 interview with BBC. She couldn't have said it better, if I'm being honest. Diana said herself, quote, while there's three of us in this marriage, so it was a bit crowded. Yeah, end quote. There's no better way of putting it, I think. That's a pretty, it's a pretty baller way of saying it. I don't know. I haven't said baller in like 13 years, but I'm like, you know what? That's a baller move. It's pretty gangster. Diana also said she was in love with riding instructor Major James Hewitt during her marriage to Charles, so everybody was busy looking at their directions, it seems. Diana and Charles divorced in 1996, only one year before her tragic car accident. Now, later in 2005, Charles ended up marrying Camilla. Has anyone seen Spencer? Kristen Stewart looked great in that movie, and now I wanna watch it. Is it worth the watch? Let me know in the comments. I didn't see you go to theaters or anything. Kind of snuck by me while I was sleeping on all the good ones. Number three, Prince Harry costume party. YouTube isn't a fan of some words, specifically one word that rhymes with Yahtzee, and it goes deep with history, as you could assume what I'm talking about. But with this being one of the biggest scandals, I have to bring it up, right? The Duke was always referred to as a bad boy, right? He was the bad royal, the bad boyal royal. I don't know, I'm trying new shit here. But just how deep did these incidents cut? Well, before he settled down with Meghan in 2018, Harry had to issue a public apology back in 2005 because, uh, whoops, somebody got photos from a costume party and a uh, few of them were in poor taste. Did the royal dress up as the beast from Beauty and the Beast? No, no he did not. Did he dress up like a witch? Like a little witch, uh, maybe with a, with a nice witch broom? No, none of that either. No, photos leaked of him wearing World War II German soldier gear. Yeah, I can't say too much, but it was even equipped with an armband, a very bad armband. Again, I can't say too much, you know, nor will YouTube allow us to show too much, but you understand what I'm trying to say. You remember. It was poor taste. He could have dressed up in any way he wanted. He's a literal prince. And he does this, it's off-putting. Harry said afterwards, and I quote, I am very sorry if I caused any offense or embarrassment to anyone. It was a poor choice of costume and I apologize. End quote. Nice, right from the heart, that's good. Really goes deep with the royal history. We love it. Number two, Vegas getaway. Nice, roll those dice. It's one thing to party like a rock star, but to party like a prince? What does that even mean? I gotta keep this Prince Harry train going because, well, now I'm mad at him, but there's even more photos from history that show what was really going down in the royal family, you know? His priorities 
memories, dare I say. After that party incident, just seven years later, scandalous photos emerged from Harry's Las Vegas trip. Yeah, I had a little boys night, it seems. It turns out what happens in Vegas may just leak online for your entire family to see and your grandmother. That's probably not a great time. These scandalous pics were taken during a strip pool game. Lovely, we like that. Make sure you call the right pocket while you're not wearing any. The scandal actually prompted St. James Palace to contact the Press Complaints Commission before the snaps even made their way to British tabloids. Yeah, they knew right off the bat they were fucked. They're like, uh, can we call them? Can we send a pigeon? What's the fastest? And finally, number one, Boy Jones and other attempts. Okay, being the queen and all in history, a security team is always needed, obviously. And during her reign, specifically Queen Victoria, there were multiple attempts to harm the young queen. First attack was in 1840. It was an 18 year old man named Edward Oxford and he fired towards the Queen's carriage. When Edward was accused of high treason, of course, afterwards, he was actually found not guilty due to, you guessed it, insanity. A couple years later, in 1842, it happened again. This time, two men fired at her, both also Missed. In 1849, her carriage was attacked by William Hamilton. In 1850, as the carriage was passing the gates of Buckingham Palace, Robert Pate, a retired soldier, might I add, ran up and hit her with his cane. Victoria was okay, luckily, but of course she was shook. Then these incidents kept occurring again in 1842, 1849, and 1872. Attempt after attempt after attempt. But then things got a little worse, and dare I say, a little bit more weird. If you haven't heard of Boy Jones or anything that happened there, I saved it for last because it's so, so horribly creepy. A teenager stalked the queen back in 1838 until 1841, and his name was Edward Jones. Edward Boy Jones. This guy somehow managed to break into Buckingham Palace more than once, right? Before Assassin's Creed came out. No idea how we thought of this. Guy just knows around in, and he would break in and would hide under the queen's sofa. That was his go-to spot. Or he would sometimes just sit on her throne. And one of the worst things ever, sometimes he would go through her drawers. He would go through the queen's drawers. That's so gross. What? Like that's, that's so, that's gross. He would steal her clothes until eventually and thankfully he got caught. Starting off our list today, we have the former king of Denmark, Christian VII, a man who spent pretty much his entire life acting like a child. Christian took to the throne at just 16 years of age in 1766, during which time he caused many a scandal and much chaos for his royal family members as well as his wife, his staff, and his people. Some of Christian's crazy quirks included inviting important guests and dignitaries to dinner parties, and then when the dignitaries greeted him and bowed, the king would hop over their backs as though he was engaging in a game of leapfrog. And once everyone was seated for dinner and the food was served, the young king would begin flinging the menu items around the room at his dinner guests. After marrying his cousin just one year after taking the throne, Christian would often run through the streets of his kingdom with his mistress, patronizing local shops and brothels in drunken fits of bad behavior. It is also said that at one point in time, the young king built his own torture rack and ordered people to tie him to the device and flog him in some sort of strange pursuit of pleasure. Next up on our list today, we have Emperor Zhang, another young ruler who partook in some pretty strange behaviors while in power. At the age of just 14, Zhang became the 11th emperor of the Ming Dynasty in 1505 and ruled until he passed at the age of 29 in 1521. Uninterested in being a ruler at such a young age, an uninterest that would remain all the way into adulthood, the emperor assigned eunuchs to all positions of power and allowed them to to run the government in his place. While ignoring his duties, the young ruler engaged in various lavish and outlandish behaviors and activities, which were paid for by the tax dollars of his people. If you are thinking that this is already sounding pretty bad, listen up. Because one of Zhang's all-time favorite activities was raiding the homes of the wealthy, kidnapping their daughters, and then demanding a ransom for the girl's safe return. And anyone who disputed this reckless behavior was arrested, tortured, and executed. And as you can imagine, and there were a lot of people who disputed this behavior. The terror did eventually come to a fitting end when in 1505, the emperor's pleasure barge capsized and Zhang drowned in the chaos. After his death, the eunuchs, which had been placed in charge of running China's government, had garnered so much power within political structures that even new rulers of the dynasty were unable to remove the eunuchs from their positions. 
Next up we've got Catherine the Great, Empress of Russia who, in all fairness, was a pretty good ruler. In fact, some might even say great. The scandal here really lies in her, um, extracurricular appetite. Catherine, originally named Sophie, was born in Germany but moved to Russia after marrying her husband Peter III in 1745. It was said that Peter had much less of an appetite and he often disregarded his wife's company for that of toy soldiers and imaginary worlds. Thus began Catherine's spy into sexual insatiability. In 1796, one of Catherine's many lovers murdered Peter and she took her position as Empress of Russia. After stepping into power at the age of 33, her desires for the company of men only grew, and she was by no means frugal towards her lovers either, gifting one with 1,000 laborers and declaring another King of Poland, who she eventually declared war against after a pretty fierce lover's spat in which Catherine accused him of being unobedient. The story of Catherine's death has been quite disputed over the years, but one version tells that she met her end during a zealous rendezvous with a palace horse. Historians, however, maintain that she suffered a stroke on the toilet and died the following day, which is the most likely, but a far less interesting explanation for sure. Next up, we have Justin II, Emperor of Byzantium. Next up, we have Justin II, Emperor of Byzantium, which at its peak included modern day Italy, Greece, Turkey, as well as some portions of North Africa and the Middle East. During Justin's rule from 1565 to 1578 AD, he was prone to acting up. He was known for constantly trying to bite officials of the court, making animal noises at passersby, and hitting people at random, unprovoked times. Many officials of the court would take turns pulling the mad emperor around the castle in a wagon in an attempt to calm his nerves, but unfortunately all efforts proved futile and people began to speculate that Justin was possessed by the devil. It was at this time that his wife Sophia, who was taking care of him, became kind of like a regent, making many political decisions on his behalf. From possessed by the devil to worshipping it, we have Marquise de Montespan, who was accused of just that after she caused a whole lot of trouble way back in the late 16 and early 1700s. You see, although both the Marquise and the King of France, Louis XIV, were married, the two had sparked up an affair for the ages, and they weren't exactly subtle about it either, with the king on many occasions showering the Marquise with intricate gifts and spending more time with her than his actual wife, Marie Therese of Austria. Austria. It appears, however, that much like Catherine the Great, Marquise became insatiable, infatuated with the king's attention, and she wished to become queen herself. Marquise de Montespan divorced her husband and began spending more time with the queen in an attempt to assess the situation and figure out her next best steps, during which time she also befriended a Parisian witch. Together, the witch and the Marquise began cooking up love potions made from the bones of some incredibly vulnerable members of society. It was this gruesome feat that led many to believe Marquise had turned to devil worship in the first place. Everything began to fall apart in 1679 after many, many members of the court experienced poisoning and the two women came under investigation. The witch was burnt at the stake while Marquise ran for the hills, in which she ironically spent the rest of her days living in a convent. Next up, we have Peter the Great, who was a pretty interesting guy, but unlike Catherine, he wasn't really all that great, or all that liked by the Russian people, over which he kept rule. While he has been credited with leading widespread reforms that led Russia to become one of the leading powers in Europe, he was less than empathetic in regards to his subjects. John Evelyn, an author in the 1600s, recounted a time he had invited Peter to stay in his home, saying that the Tsar of Russia, along with an entourage, trashed the author's place, destroying portraits and priceless family heirlooms, tearing apart the gardens, and soiling at least 12 blankets. Whatever that means. Perhaps though, the strangest thing that Peter did was implement a beard tax, in which he required the country's residents to either shave their faces or pay a fine for their insubordination. His members of staff, however, were not given this option and instead were lined up to have their faces shaved by Peter himself. It is important to note that during this time, it was believed by Russia's Orthodox Church that having a bare face was a sin and went against God. But Peter insisted, saying that the new look was a necessary sacrifice in order to keep up with the trends of the more advanced Western Europeans. 
Next up we've got King Charles VI who ruled France from 1380 to 1422. It seems in 1392 the king suffered from a high fever and convulsions which apparently was the beginning of his downfall as directly after the illness Charles began slowly slipping into insanity. He experienced bouts of paranoia and rage which caused him to become a danger to anyone around him during the episodes. Perhaps his strangest symptom however was the reoccurring belief that his entire body was made of glass. And when this delusion occurred, he would refuse to move for hours on end, terrified of breaking. It even got so bad that at one point he had to be cut out of his clothes after neglecting his hygiene and refusing to change for days out of fear that he might simply shatter. Next on our list today, we have Justinian II, not to be mistaken with Justin II. Justinian II ruled Byzantium in the year 685 AD. In another great example of why children should not be given such high positions of power, at the at the age of just 16, Justinian took to the throne with a brutality soaked iron fist, murdering those who served him out of spite for losing battles, persecuting religious minorities, and imposing high taxes on his people in order to pay for armies and buildings are only a few of the many horrible acts performed by Justinian that eventually led to the people turning on him. I guess at some point his subjects became so sick of his terror that they started an uprising to overthrow his rule during which they forcefully slit his tongue and cut off his nose in order to deter him from ever seeking to regain the throne. Justinian eventually replaced his nose with a gold prosthetic and, much to the public's dismay, did reclaim the throne in 1705 and ruled until 1711 when he was killed and ruled until 1711 when he was killed by mutinous soldiers. I mean, they did kind of warn him. Next up, we have Joanna Castile, the former queen of Castile and Aragon, also known as Joanna the Mad. She came into power in Castile in 1504 and gained control of Aragon in 1516, the union of which led to the evolution of modern day Spain. On October 20th of 1496, Joanna had married Philip I of Burgundy, son of the Holy Roman Empire. When Joanna first stepped into the throne in 1504, all seemed well. When Joanna first stepped into the throne in 1504, all seemed well. It wasn't until around two years later when it appeared she began to unravel. You see, Joanna, who who had six children by Philip loved her husband. In fact, she loved him so much that when he died in the year 1506, she couldn't bear the idea of living without him by her side, and so she figured out a way to avoid having to. After his death, Joanna had Philip embalmed and then ordered him to be kept with her at all times. She refused to be separated from her late husband, keeping him in her room, sleeping next to him, and even taking him along on long journeys. All of this strange behavior led royal family members as well as the public to declare Joanna unfit to rule, and so her and Philip's son Charles eventually took on the role of regent, allowing his mother to live out her days with her deceased husband and taking on the role of the true leader of Spain. And finally to finish us off today we have Mustafa, the first former Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, which in its heyday stretched from the Balkans in southeastern Europe all the way to Anatolia, Central Asia, Arabia, and North Africa. In 1603 Mustafa's older brother Ahmed claimed the throne at the young age of 13. In accordance with Ottoman culture at the time, Ahmed was told to execute his brother so that Mustafa may never attempt to take the throne out from under him. Luckily or unluckily, I'm not really sure, Ahmed refused to take the life of his brother but instead locked him in a windowless prison cell until Ahmed eventually passed away, at which time Mustafa was forced to step up and assume the throne. Unfortunately, however, by this point in time, after having spent many years in maddening solitude, Mustafa was in no way fit to rule and was soon replaced by his nephew Osman. When when Osman passed shortly after his coronation, Mustafa was once again instated as ruler. This time, however, he refused to leave his cage and so he had to be physically removed and placed on the throne. Mustafa spent his second rule feverishly scouring the castle for Osman, believing the former king to still be alive and begging him to come back to the throne. Eventually, this became too much for the people to handle and once again Mustafa was removed from his position of power and sent back to his prison where he later died of a seizure due to madness in 1693. Number 10, the queen traveled with her own supply of redness. When traveling by plane, Elizabeth wouldn't leave her castle without her own supply. Well, that's quite an unusual tidbit, isn't it? The idea that a monarch would tote around a personal stash seems straight out of a vampire novel, but there is a peculiar reason behind it. You see, the British royal family takes their security very seriously, and that includes the health of their reigning monarch. Or, well, may she rest in peace. 
And it's not because they're secretly undead, even though I'm sure there's an urban legend out there somewhere, but rather a precautionary measure. In case of a medical emergency or surgery while traveling abroad, there must be a readily available source of compatible fluids. This practice dates back to the early 20th century when King George V was on the throne. It's not just any old bags of the stuff, mind you. It's always the same rare type. O negative. The reason being, O negative is considered the universal donor type, which means it can safely be given to anybody in need, regardless of their type. This ensures there's no delay in obtaining a suitable match in critical situations. So while it may seem a little bit unusual, the royal family's habit of traveling with a stash is ultimately a precautionary measure aimed at safeguarding the health of the monarch, ensuring they have a lifeline to medical treatment should the need ever arise. In addition, their personal doctor is never more than a few paces away, always carrying a bulky medical bag containing a mobile defibrillator and all manner of emergency medicine if need be. You hope it never happens, but hey, in case of emergency, darn. So much for the queen being a vampire before she passed away. Number 9. Kissing Cousins Now here's a rather peculiar fact about the British royal family that might raise some eyebrows. The late Queen Elizabeth II and her husband Prince Philip were actually distant cousins. Yep, yep, you heard me correctly, they shared a family tree. Their connection can be traced back to Queen Victoria, who reigned over the British Empire from 1837 to 1901. Victoria was often referred to as the Grandmother of Europe because her descendants married into many other European royal families. One of her granddaughters, Princess Alice, married into the Greek royal family, and their son, Prince Andrew of Greece and Denmark, became the father of Prince Philip. On the other side of the equation, Queen Elizabeth II is also Queen Victoria's great-great-granddaughter through her father, King George VI. Now let's not jump to any hasty conclusions or weird comparisons. These familial ties were quite distant, and royal intermarriage was not uncommon in Europe's history. It's worth noting that during the late 19th and early 20th centuries, many royal families intermarried to maintain their royal bloodlines. So while it might sound unusual to our modern ears, the connection between Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip is a product of a bygone era, where royal bloodlines intertwined across the continent. Eh, arranged marriages. What can you do? Number 8. A politician is taken hostage in the palace every year An intriguing, if not unsettling, fact about some royal traditions involves the annual politician hostage scenario. Yeah, it's as bizarre as it sounds. In certain royal households, kind of like our royal family, there exists a long-standing custom where a politician is quite literally taken hostage within the palace for a brief period each year. The origins of this tradition are shrouded in mystery, but it's believed to be a symbolic gesture, signifying the monarch's authority over the government. Typically, a high-ranking government official is selected for this role, and they willingly participate. The hostage is treated with all the royal luxuries during their stay, but they are expected to be at the monarch's beck and call, ready to discuss matters of state at any moment. While it might seem like a little quirky royal tradition, it serves as a reminder of the historical relationship between monarchs and politicians. In modern times, this practice has evolved into a ceremonial gesture rather than a, you know, true hostage situation, but it's a fascinating glimpse into the unique customs that persist within certain royal families. Number 7. Three of the Queen's four descendants got divorced That's a statistic that doesn't sound too nice. You may be surprised to learn that out of Queen Elizabeth's four offspring, a staggering three of them went through divorces. Yep, that's right. Three quarters, a significant portion of her descendants, had marriages that uh, didn't stand the test of time. First in line is Princess Anne, the Queen's only daughter. Her marriage to Captain Mark Phillips ended in divorce in 1992, making her the first British royal of the modern area to divorce. Next up is Prince Andrew, Duke of York. His marriage to Sarah Ferguson, also known as Fergie, faced turmoil and ultimately ended in divorce in 1996, just a couple years later. And finally, we have Prince Charles, oh, pardon me. King Charles, whose highly publicized and tumultuous marriage to Princess Diana ended in divorce in 1996 as well. Whew. These divorces caused significant waves within the royal family and the public eye. It's a stark contrast to the historical norms of royals remaining in often unhappy marriages for the sake of tradition and appearances. These events reflect the changing attitudes towards marriage and divorce in the modern world, even within the royal corridors of Buckingham Palace. Number 6. Royals always carry a black outfit Here's a curious royal quirk for you. Members of the British royal family are known to always pack a black outfit when they travel. It might sound eerie at first, or you know, gothic, but there is a practical reason behind this tradition. The reason for this is to be prepared for the unexpected, specifically in the event of you know a sudden death within the family. If a royal family member were to pass away while they're abroad, it's customary for the rest of the family to wear black as a sign of mourning. So having a black outfit on hand ensures that they can adhere to this tradition even when far from home. 
This practice is an extension of the long-standing customs and protocols that govern the behavior and attire of the British royal family. It highlights the importance placed on maintaining a dignified and respectful image in times of crises, even when traveling to far-flung corners of the world. While it might seem unsettling, it's a reminder of the weight of the responsibilities and the traditions that continue to shape the lives of royals today. For example, so was there ever an instance when this didn't happen? Yep. In 1952, the Queen was in Kenya with Prince Philip when they heard the news that her father had sadly passed away. She had brought a black dress with her on the trip, meaning she had to wait on the plane for one to be delivered, so that she didn't arrive in the country wearing, you know, unsuitable clothing. Ever since, don't forget the black dress. Number five, the queen had weights sewn into her headlines. So picture this, the regal poised figure of Queen Elizabeth II, adorned in her elegant outfits. But what you might not know is that hidden within those impeccable garments were weights. Yep, weights sewn into her clothes. But why would the queen, or any royal for that matter, resort to such a seemingly unconventional measure? The answer lies in practicality and precision. You see, maintaining that signature royal grace, especially outdoors, can be a can be very challenging when the wind decides to um, dance with one's clothing. Been there, done that. Not fun. To prevent any wardrobe malfunctions and to ensure her attire remained impeccable, small weights were discreetly added to the hems of her dresses and skirts. This prevented them from billowing or flying up in gusts of wind, preserving her dignified appearance. Yeah, it's not fun when that happens. It's a fascinating glimpse into the meticulous attention to detail that goes into every aspect of royal life, right down to the clothing. So it may seem a little weird to think about, you know, weights sewn into regal attire. It's just one of the many secrets behind the seemingly effortless poise and elegance of the former British monarch. Number four, bad news. So remember the need for the black dress I chatted about just like a moment ago? Alrighty, so imagine this. You're a queen, head of the state, and you find out that your father, the previous king, has passed away, not from like a personal message or a trusted source, but from a news broadcast. Crazy, isn't it? Well, this is exactly what happened to Queen Elizabeth II on February 6th of 1952. She was in Kenya on a royal tour with her husband when her father, King George, died unexpectedly in his sleep. The news was delivered to her through a radio broadcast, as the remote location had limited means of communication. This incident sheds light on the complexities of being a monarch, where personal emotions are often intertwined with the demands of duty. Queen Elizabeth's sudden transition to the throne was a momentous event in British history, and it came with the weight of responsibility, even in the face of personal grief. It's a poignant reminder that even the highest figures in the land can be caught off guard by the unpredictability of life, and duty sometimes takes precedence over personal feelings, even in the most unsettling of circumstances. Yeah, that's something I'm kind of familiar with. Number three, the queen's uncle was a what now? Alrighty folks, disclaimer time. The interwebs don't like when I say the name of the bad guy German group from the Second World War, so bear with me here. Edward VIII was briefly king until the abdication crises of 1936, when he abandoned the throne to marry American divorcee Wallace Simpson. The couple visited Germany, where they had a meeting with the evil dictator, whose name I cannot say, trust me, I wish I could for this, according to the BBC. Photographs of the royal encouraging the queen and princess to do a, you know, certain salute in 1933, while they were, you know, very young, was also published in the Sun in 2015. Look, the princess could not have known at the time what the salute meant, or what its connotations would later become. While the extent of Edward's political leanings remain a subject of debate, it's clear that his actions raised some eyebrows both within and um, outside the royal family. Edward's ties cast a shadow over his legacy, especially during a time when Britain was at war with the Yahtzees. His abdication and subsequent ascension of Queen Elizabeth's father were pivotal moments in British history. This unsettling fact reminds us that even within the highest ranks of royalty, complex and controversial figures can emerge, leaving a lasting impact on the course of history. Yikes. Number two, the family filmed a secret documentary. Alrighty, Lost Media folks, this one is for you. In the dark corners of royal history, there exists a truly unique relic, a documentary filmed by the British royal family in 1969, which was broadcast one time, and one time only, and then seemingly vanished into obscurity. The documentary, known as Royal Family, was an attempt to offer a more candid and relatable view of the monarchy to the public. This unprecedented insight into the lives of royals included scenes of them at play, their domestic routines, and intimate family moments. Now, Queen Elizabeth II herself reportedly approved the project, hoping it would humanize the monarchy in the eyes of the British people. However, the documentary received mixed reactions. While some appreciated the glimpse into the royal household, others found it unsettling. 
feeling that it demystified the monarchy to an uncomfortable degree. Intriguingly, after its initial broadcast, this documentary was shelved and has never been shown again on television. It remains locked away in the royal archives, inaccessible to the public. This captivating historical tidbit raises quite a few questions about the balance between, you know, preserving the mystique of royalty, but also like the desire for transparency in our modern age. The fact that it was broadcast like one time and one time only, and then hidden away, ooh, I'd love to get my fingers on it and just like see what's up. How bad can it be? Number one, they work hard to preserve the lineage. So back in the early days of aviation, when flying was still a very risky endeavor, a peculiar and somewhat unsettling rule was enforced within the British royal family. Two heirs to the throne were never allowed to travel together on the same flight. This seemingly paranoid practice was rooted in a desire to ensure the continuity of the monarchy in the event of a tragic accident. Well, imagine a scenario where an unfortunate plane crash would take, like, everybody out and then, where's your lineage? This would throw the entire line of succession into chaos. So to mitigate this risk, the royal protocol dictated that direct heirs, such as the reigning monarch and their immediate successor, should not travel on the same plane. This practice persisted for several decades, only changing as aviation safety improved over time. Thankfully, today's air travel is far safer, and such practices have become relics of the past. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the Kensington system. Queen Victoria's reign began in 1837, and it lasted up until her death in 1901. She was just 18 years old when she found herself on the throne, and it was all by chance, as she was actually fifth in line when she was born. This is all stressful enough, but certainly one of the worst parts of her upbringing was being brought up under the Kensington system. This basically all started when her mother, Duchess Victoria of Kent, created this system in order to control her daughter, literally just isolated her away from all of her friends and even from other family members, and apparently this was done to keep her quote unquote pure. The Duchess would monitor her every move, she would decide who she could see and who she could speak to, and Victoria only had two friends she could play with growing up, one being her half-sister and the other being her mother's attendant, Sir John Conroy. Victoria was even forced to share a room with her mother until she was queen. She couldn't even walk down the hall by herself. In the end, Victoria placed a lot of blame on John Conroy for manipulating her mother. She even called him the demon incarnate. In our number 9 spot today, we have the royal affairs. There have been many, many rumors over the years about the royal family and their extramarital affairs. Okay, I'm not saying it's a tradition, but it happens a lot, and I'm saying this goes way back. So far back that one of the first accusations of this within the royal family dates all the way back to Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn. Since then, it has only continued with people such as Princess Margaret and Peter Townsend, Princess Anne and Commander Timothy Lawrence, and of course, King Charles and Queen Consort Camilla just to name a few. The latter of those definitely being the most famous, especially when the now king was confronted about it by his wife at the time, the beloved Princess Diana. Apparently, King Charles responded to the confrontation by saying, quote, well, I refuse to be the only Prince of Wales who never had a mistress. Maybe not the attitude to keep when you're speaking to your wife, who you're cheating on. I don't know. Guess I'm just not royal enough to get it. In our number eight spot today, we have pets. As we all know very well, image is everything for the royal family, and that is down to the finest, smallest detail, including pets. It is well known that the queen absolutely loved corgis, and how could we possibly blame her? Apparently, however, if a dog is not a corgi or a Labrador, it is socially looked down upon. Can't describe how insane that is. They're dogs. If you brought a dog who had just been rolling around in the mud everywhere with you, I could see why that wouldn't be as widely accepted among fancy social circles, but only giving the choice of a few random breeds seems kind of ridiculous. Apparently, Meghan Markle actually had to give up her beagle named Guy a few years ago before she joined the family. And then left it. I guess she can probably have whatever dog she wants now, so there's always an upside. In our number 7 spot today, we have King Charles I. Okay, this is one that goes way back and it really creeps me out. So King Charles I, right now we're on the third, so we're taking it a couple back. King Charles I was tried for treason after the Civil War, and he ended up being beheaded in 1649. I guess in the 1600s, everyone was beheaded, so this wasn't necessarily abnormal, which is certainly weird, but that's a history lesson for another day. The weird part of this, however, is that apparently 
His head was sewn back on his body so that he could sit for a portrait. Or it was perhaps supposed to be a sign of respect. Either way, it's very weird and very gross. I feel terrible for whoever's job it was to do that, and I also feel bad for the artist who was forced to paint that. Talk about traumatic. It does certainly make sense though that people say that Charles Ghost still haunts a building because there is no amount of haunting that could make up for being beheaded and then having your head sewn back onto your body. Okay, why'd we do the first part if we were gonna do the second? Could have just cut the middleman, you know? But instead, they cut his head off, okay? <laughs> in our number six spot today, we have never travel in pairs. This is one travel rule that certainly makes sense, but it is really dark when you think about it. This rule is one that the British royal family, and honestly many people who can afford this sort of luxury safety do nowadays. This tradition and rule is one that means that any heirs to the throne are not allowed to travel together. This is of course in case some sort of accident happens, not every heir to the throne would be injured or perhaps killed. It's definitely very smart and sensible, but it has got to be grim, just constantly preparing for the worst thing to happen. It is of the utmost importance to the royal family that they preserve the line to the throne. Like I mentioned before, however, other people are now taking a page out of the royal book and are using this travel rule where possible. In our number five spot today, we have the black outfit. Another travel rule that the royal family must follow is in regards to an item that they have to bring with them on all trips, whether business or pleasure. It is pretty unusual to see the royal family dressed in black, despite when a specific occasion calls for it, but every time they travel, they're required to bring an all black outfit with them. This is to prepare for the worst case scenario. If they are away on a trip and somebody important to them passes away, they need to ensure that they are ready with the appropriate clothing for when they are able to touch down on their home soil. This is of course very practical, but it's definitely kind of morbid. I mean, you're having to fuss over what you're going to wear when you're actually just mourning the loss of someone close to you. It certainly wouldn't be the top of my list of things to focus on, but maybe that's why I'm not cut out for royalty. Okay. In our number four spot today, we have the rules of the road. Okay. This like rule or tradition or law, I guess, is probably one of the craziest things I've ever heard, but I guess it's been around for quite a while and I just had no idea. As it turns out, the monarch is the only person in the UK who is allowed to drive without a legal license or even license plates. Like. That's insane. I didn't expect the king to have to take a driver's test like everyone else, but just having a rule that allows them, if they chose to, to drive without any idea how? It's pretty bizarre. The good news is though, which makes this rule make a lot more sense, is that of course, rather than driving himself, King Charles' chauffeur will be much more responsible for most of the driving for the king. Let's just hope the chauffeur has their driver's license. I'm not gonna lie, there's this like silly photo of the queen, and every time I think about like the monarch driving without a license, I just think of this like little photo. She's got like a little silly grin on her face. She looks mischievous. And that's what I like to think, her just driving with no license. In our number three spot today, we have the armed forces. This is a tradition or system that comes into play when a new monarch comes into power. So last year, this happened with the king after the passing of the queen. It is definitely one of the most intimidating parts of his new role. And this is that King Charles now becomes the head of the armed forces. This means that it is his responsibility and he is the only person who can declare when the country is at war and when the war is over. Of course, he won't be doing this entirely alone. He needs to follow the advice and guidance of the government. The perhaps good news is that the new king has held quite close ties to the armed forces throughout his life, even spending time in the Royal Navy and taking flying instruction from the Royal Air Force during his second year at Cambridge University. Of course, the hope is that he won't have to be in a position to make these difficult decisions, but when or if he's faced with them, we can hope he makes the proper decisions for the country. In our number two spot today, we have no touching. There is a rule that you just cannot touch a royal. I'm sure there's a multitude of reasons for this, mostly to do with security, but aside from a very lucky handshake, you really are supposed to keep your distance. I suppose it's because I live the life of a regular person, but I kind of feel like in some ways this might be a little sad. I feel like you might be lacking in so much connection with a ton of interesting people. And like some of the people that you meet, wouldn't you just be dying to hug them? 
You know, apparently this is part of the reason why the queen always wore gloves. She of course shook a lot of hands while making her royal appearances, and the same will likely go for the new king. Maybe he'll take up gloves as a fashion accessory, just like his mother. And finally, in our number one spot today, we have the church. So we talked about the armed forces, and King Charles won't only be the head of the armed forces, but he will also become the head of the church in England. Quite a jump from talking about war and being the one who makes those kinds of decisions to being the head of the church, where things hopefully are quite the opposite. This is a post that British monarchs have held since the church was founded by King Henry VIII in the 1500s, and it appears as though the tradition will carry on. In this role, it means that King Charles will be responsible for appointing archbishops and bishops to their role. The king will of course be advised in this role by the prime minister, and it is said that the king is religious in his own right and that he has already spoken about how his personal faith has informed his approach to leadership. 